All right, what we're going to talk about today, I, I, I want to talk to you about being hungry for the things of God. Now, one of the biggest challenges for any Christian is to be both filled and hungry at the same time. That's, that's the biggest challenge that we face. And it kind of sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. Because in the natural, if, actually, let, let me back up. What is hunger is a sign of both natural and spiritual health, okay? For those of us who've ever had kids, you've sat awake at night because he or she wouldn't eat. When your child doesn't eat, it's a sign that something's not going on right within their body. It's the same thing spiritually. So our job is to maintain this sense of both fullness and hunger. And when you live in an environment of blessing, your challenge is to maintain this sense of hunger constantly. Why? Hunger is an indication of humility. Hunger is an indication that I need something. Humility is that same, that I, I need something. And we're going to go through several scriptures today which talk about that need. So, I know it sounds like a contradiction when I say, when I say you have to be both full and hungry at the same time, but it's not. Because in the natural, how do you get hungry? By not eating. In the spiritual, how do you get hungry? By feeding yourself. The more you feed yourself, the hungrier you become for the things of God. Amen? Amen. So we're going to start out today in the book of Deuteronomy. We're actually going to end up in Psalms. We're going to read several Psalms today. But we're going to start in De Deuteronomy 8, chapter 3. Deuteronomy 8, 3 says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. This, again, this is hilarious. It's the first part of this verse which is so hilarious when you look at the meaning of the words. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and feed you with manna. Does anybody know what manna means? And manna, of course, means it's the food of angels, but it means, what is it? He humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with what is it? which you didn't know. Neither did your fathers know that he might make you know. Here's the thing. What is it? I, I fed you with what is it? <laughs> it's so funny. I allowed you to exist in the mystery of what is it so that out of that mystery you would know something. You would know that man doesn't live by bread alone. I fed you what is it? It's, it's, it's <laughs> That's, that's, to me, that's, that's funny. That, what is it? I'm not going to tell you. Just eat it. Yeah. What is it? I'm not going to tell you. But out of that, you'll know something. There's a lot of times we're asking God, what is it? What is it that I'm going through? What is it that I'm doing wrong? What is it that's going on? And God says, Trust me in the middle of it. I'm going to feed you. What is it? And the end result of that. So here, here's the thing. There's oftentimes we're asking questions at this level. Dad knows you need an answer on this level. There are times you're going to ask for answers. And you won't always get the answer you asked for. You will always get the answer you need. Amen? God knows that if you ask for an answer here, he knows you're prepared for an answer here. Amen? All right. What is that? To me, that's just hilarious. I gave you what is it to eat. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to skip on over to Psalm 107. We're talking about being hungry for God. You were fed with manna. You were fed with what is it? What is it is the mystery. So here's the thing about Psalm 107. 
Psalm 107 is a psalm. You remember God took Israel out of Egypt and he was leading them to the promised land. And through the journey, they went through several different places and he knew, or they knew he was taking them to a place where they had orchards which were already planted, they had vineyards which were already planted, there was already buildings and houses there which, which they were going to occupy, filled with things that they didn't have to buy. And all through this journey, they were, they, you know, in their minds, they were looking for some place to live, but he had a specific destination in mind for them. So we're going to pick up here in 107 verse 4. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to the city for a dwelling place. And one more thing I want to look at here in Isaiah. We're, we're, again, we're talking about hunger and the purpose of hungry people. God uses hungry people to establish cities. Let, let me just say that. That's where we're going. Hungry people establish cities. Um, in Isaiah 29, the Lord describes a situation. And in this situation, he finishes it, or he uses verse 8 to describe what happens to those in this situation. He said, it shall be that when a hungry man dreams, that man is dreaming of food. He wakes up, there's no food. He's still hungry. When a thirsty man dreams, he's dreaming of something to drink, but when he wakes up, he doesn't have nothing to drink, so he's still thirsty. The point being is that hunger stirs up dreams. Hunger, when you're hungry for the things of God, it stirs up dreams. You know, those who've actually lost their desire for like improvement, improvement of their business, improvement of their, their marriage, improvement of their relationships, they simply lost hunger. That's all it is. They've lost that hunger. In Proverbs, Solomon says something really cool. He says, you know what? We don't hate someone when they steal to satisfy the hunger of their family. They still have to pay back seven times what they stole, but we don't hate them. We, 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 we don't hate them because we know that hunger was the reason that they stepped outside of what is comfortable. All right? So that natural hunger caused them to step outside of what's comfortable. Spiritual hunger will make you step outside of what's comfortable to yourself. How do you get hungry? You feed yourself. I, I know this for a fact because, and I, I don't remember what precipitated buying this book, uh, that advanced Bible study course. For me, that was the first taste of real hunger for me. E.W. King has an advanced Bible study course, and the chapter three is called Acting on the Word of God. And that lit a fire under me. And it precipitated me stepping outside of my comfort zone and allowed me to see my first heal healing miracle. Being hungry will push you out to do things. It is absolutely imperative for us to remain hungry. That is part of spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity in the kingdom is dictated by hunger. And here's the problem. If, if you don't maintain hunger, <clears throat> if you don't maintain hunger, you'll end up living off the interest of yesterday's investment. Then what happens? Yesterday becomes last week. Last week becomes last month. Last month becomes last year. Last year becomes last decade. If you're not hungry, you will not continually feed yourself on the things that God is doing. You won't continually have that, that experience of, of having that hunger field, and you'll end up living off of yesterday's investment. And yesterday's investment is kind of like yesterday's manna. You remember what happened to that, right? <laughs> it got spoiled. So, it, it, okay, here, here's the most important part of this. It is a requirement for people who are going to have a transforming influence on a region to maintain that sense of hunger. Because we have to be constantly connected with his presence. 
We have to be constantly connected with his word. We have to be constantly connected with his move. What I've been doing uh, is feeding myself on certain things. So we're going to read some things out of there. La I've been reading this book I, I told a couple of friends about called Britain's Spiritual Inheritance. I love reading things like this. You know, this is why if you're into fitness, there's muscle and fitness magazines. If you're into cars, there's road and track. If you're into fashion, there's, what's a fashion magazine? Like GQ or Cop, whatever. If you're into those things, those things are designed to feed that. What's designed to feed our spiritual? We have the Bible. We have testimonies. We have songs and psalms. So I've been reading some, certain things. I'm going to read a couple of excerpts for you uh, from this Bible, from, from this book called Britain's Spiritual Inheritance. All right? The first one is going to come from Charles Finney. Charles Finney. Called Waves of Liquid Love. Without any expectation of it, without ever having the thought in my mind, there was any such thing for me, the Holy Spirit descended on me in a manner that seemed to go through my body and soul. I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love, for I could not express it any other way. It seemed the very breath, the of God. I can recollect that it seemed to fan me like immense wings, no words can express the wonderful love that was shed abroad in my heart. I wept aloud with joy and love. I do not know, but I should say I literally bellowed out the unutterable gushings of my heart. That's from Charles Finney. Everybody know who Charles Finney was? Yeah, okay, all right. Maybe you haven't heard of this guy. I, I like to introduce new stuff to people. I'm pretty sure nobody's heard of this dude. Next one, Smith Wigglesworth. <laughs> Smith Wigglesworth, baptized in the Holy Spirit. I came to Sunderland. Now, Sunderland was Britain's equivalent of Azusa Street. And, I, I, and I'm, I'm getting the I can't remember if it was right before or right after. I think it was right after Azusa Street. But some Wigglesworth said, I came to Sunderland with a holy breathing cry after this clear manifestation of tongues. At about 11 a.m. Tuesday morning at All Saints Vicarage, I asked a sister to help me with the witness of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She laid hands on me in the presence of her brother. The fire fell and burned in me till the Holy Spirit revealed absolute purity before God. I love that. Absolute purity before God. A marvelous revelation took place. My body became full of light and holy presence. And in the revelation, I saw this. An empty cross. And at the same time, the Jesus I loved and adored crowned in glory in a reigning position. An empty cross. Amen. The glorious remembrance of these moments is beyond my expression to give. When I could not find words to express them, an irresistible power filled me and moved, me, moved my being till I found, to my glorious astonishment, I was speaking in other tongues clearly. After this, a burning love for everybody filled my soul. Amen. That was Smith Wigglesworth. All right, here's another one. William Booth. Anybody ever heard of him? Founder of the Salvation Army. This one, every time I read this, I start laughing. <laughs> there have been men with greater brains than I. <laughs> That's how it starts off. <laughs> there have been men with greater brains than I, men with great opportunities, but from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of all Jesus Christ could do with them, on that day, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth that there was. And if there's anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has had all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. Amen. Amen. All right. Another one. Anybody ever heard of this guy? Oh, yeah. D.L. Moody. Okay. I'm not, I'm not introducing you guys to anybody. I... Wow. Y'all going to give me a complex. D.L. Moody. A sacred experience. I was crying all the time that God would fill me with his spirit. Well, one day in the city of New York, on what, oh, what a day. I cannot describe it. 
I seldom refer to it. It is almost too sacred an experience to name. Paul had an experience of which he never spoke for 14 years. I can only say that God revealed himself to me, and I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. I went to preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths, yet hundreds were converted. I would not be placed back where I was before that blessed experience for all of the world. Amen. All right. Evan Roberts. I know nobody's heard of this guy. Evan Roberts? You've heard of him? All right. Evan Roberts was huge in the Welsh Revival. A lot of miracles and things happened at his hands. He recalls that after praying for 11 years, I was taken up to a great expanse without time and space. It was communion with God. I found myself with unspeakable joy and awe in the very presence of the Almighty God. I was privileged to speak face to face with him as a man speaks face to face with a friend. Before this, a far off God I had. I was frightened that night, but never again since. So great was my shivering that I rocked the bed and my brother, being awakened, took hold of me thinking I was ill. After that experience, I was awakened every night a little after one. What it was, I cannot tell you, except it was divine. I felt it, and it seemed to change all my nature, and I saw things different in a different light. And I knew that God was going to work in the land, and not only in this land, but in the world. George Jeffries, great healing evangelist. I read these stories because that is my, my desire to see that manifestation here. Great manifestations of healings by this man of God. And the reason I'm putting him up there with pictures and everything, I want you to see that they are absolutely no different than you and I. Their difference is they were hungry. We all have that same seed of hunger. Jesus said, no man can come to me except what? The Father so the father plants a seed in him. Those who embrace that seed come. Those who don't go. God places a seed of hunger in everyone. Feed it. Okay, George Jefferson. We were kneeling in prayer one Sunday morning and were interceding. It was at exactly 9 o'clock when the power of God came upon me. I received such an inflow of divine life that I can only liken the experience of being charged with electricity. It seemed as if my head was connected to the most powerful electric battery. My whole body, from head to foot, was quickened by the Spirit of God, and I was healed. Amen. All right, one more. Reinhard Bonnke. Rather than read it, I'll just tell you about it. In 1962, um, he had just finished Bible school, and he was walking through the streets of London and was walking past George Jeffrey's house. George Jeffrey at this time was literally on his deathbed. And he told his, his, the people in his house, I mean, somebody's going to come by here for prayer today. Don't stop him. Let him come into my room. And it was Reinhard Bonnke. And so Reinhard walked into his room. George Jeffries laid hands on him. And what happened? There was an impartation. The next day, George Jeffries died and went home to be with the Lord. Reinhard Bonnke wrote of this, and I'm just only going to read the last line. I've caught a mantle. That day, the baton and the flame met, and I've been running ever since. Why am I telling you these stories? I'm trying to feed your hunger. I'm trying to feed your hunger. You know, hunger, being hungry, is truly what I believe Jesus meant when he said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Poor in spirit are those who are hungry, those who know that they have something, that the kingdom of heaven, that dad actually has something that they need. Those who are hungry actually pull on heaven until that environment becomes this environment. You know, being hungry 
King David learned something. David prayed something in Psalm, Psalm 40, 17, Psalm 75, Psalm 86, 10, and Psalm 109, 22. There's something common about each one of those verses. Can, can anybody tell me what it is? The common phrase. Each one of those says, I am poor and needy. You, do you guys get that? This is King David. Who is, King David was like the richest man on the planet. Okay, you're not really... Un King David, like today, when you look at the Forbes list, between one, two, three, four, a couple billion dollars. There was no one close to David. But he said, I am poor and needy. I am poor. Look, we're going to talk about spiritual things all day. We're, but I'm gonna, just for this, we're going to bring it down to the natural. We're, let's talk about money for a second. How much is too much? How much is too much? There is. Out there is. No. How much is too much? Too much is any amount that pulls you out of dependence from, on God. Amen. And it's different for everyone. Like for Brother Joe, I don't think there, I mean, 100 million, 200 million, 300 million. For someone else? Me, for me? I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's whatever amount. David, the richest man on the planet, said, I am poor and needy. Like I said, there is very little separating the men on the Forbes list. There was no one close. And not only that, he had the blessing of God all over him. Whatever he, I mean, anything he wanted to do, he had the resources to do it. He wants a victory over this village. He's got the resources to go over there. He's got the army to go do it. Whatever he wants. Not only that, when he had his indiscretion with Bathsheba, what did the Lord tell him? You know, if what I've given you wasn't enough, all you got to do is ask. All you got to do is ask. And he says, I'm poor and needy. This is all of my, my adult Christian life. Whenever I looked at the verses in the Bible, it says David was a man after God's own heart. I have been so militarily covenant minded. When I say militarily, I mean militarily covenant minded. I said, you know, David is a covenant king. He understands covenant. And that is the part of God's heart. But as I'm studying, God said, no, it's his whole being. The fact that he stayed in a state of dependence, no matter what he had, was after God's own heart. That's how we can be after his heart, is staying in that state of dependence on him. Amen? All right, we're going to go back into the psalm. So we, we start out in Psalm 107. We we're up toward the top of the psalm. We're going to go toward the bottom of the psalm now. We're going to describe a situation. We're going to start in Psalm 107.33. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to read four psalms, 33, 34, 35, and 36. But between, so after 34, I'm going to slide in a verse out of Luke. Okay? Just to try to paint a picture. So he turns rivers into wilderness and the water spring into dry ground. So think about this. Rivers and water springs are what people would normally settle because it's where abundance takes place. Water signifies abundance. Well, water also uh, signifies the Holy Spirit, but but when in the, in the agricultural society, wherever there was water, there was abundance. All right? He turns rivers into wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. So again, so I'm going to sandwich in a scripture from Luke right now. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich has he sent away empty. Is this God's disdain for prosperity? No. This is God's disdain for people who, be, who have become self-satisfied. This is God's disdain for people who have become satisfied with what they have, and when they come to him, they come to him as though they don't need anything from him. I don't care what you have. 
I don't care how much you have. I don't care how much anointing you have. I don't care how many people you've laid hands on and seen recover. I don't care how much, whatever you have, you are always dependent on God. He has filled who? He filled who? The hungry. He filled those who are in a state of dependence on him. He filled those who, who said, Lord, I have a need. Now, if, a, if an absolutely wealthy man came to him and said, Lord, I have a need, would he turn him away? No. Absolutely not. It's not God's disdain for prosperity. And, and the reason I want to point this out, because in this society we actually have this, this spirit of, I, I don't know if I call it jealousy or what, against people who are prosperous. And we've got to guard our hearts against that. All right? For some reason, I don't know why, but there's people who want to take away from the haves and get to the have-nots. I'm not for it. God isn't for that, and God doesn't hate prosperity. What he hates is a wrong heart. Go back to 107.34, please. A fruitful land and barrenness the, for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. I believe that wickedness goes further than just what they did. I think the wickedness are those, a wicked heart is a heart that is no longer dependent on God for anything. That is a wicked heart. Amen? All right. So we're going to skip down to 35. So 35 and 36, we see him reversing what he did in 33 and 34. He turns the wilderness into pools of water and dry land into water springs. There he makes who to dwell? In the abundant land, he puts the hungry people there. Why? That they may establish a city for a dwelling place. Why is God so bent on the hungry establishing a city? Because God wants the DNA of that city to be defined by those who are hungry. He wants the interpersonal re react, uh, relations to be t defined by those who are hungry. He wants the government to be defined by those who are hungry for him. There he makes the hungry to dwell, that they may establish a city for a dwelling place. What happens in that city? Healings happen in that city. Deliverance happens in that city. Right teachings about him happen in that city. One of the things that is so vitally important in every, every message that comes out of this pulpit has an underlying theme to it. Dad loves you. Dad absolutely loves you. Why do I call him dad? Because that's who he is. And the more comfortable we, we get with that, the easier it is to go to him. Your dad is the creator of the universe Amen. who absolutely loves you. I, uh, we can't stress that enough. All right. So verse 36 says, he makes the hungry to dwell and he, that he may establish a city. What is he saying? that the destiny and strength of that city goes with the destiny and strength of the hungry ones he placed in it. The DNA of that city is to be established by those he's placed in it. 